Hello. In our previous lecture, we have examined different dimensions of organization, organization structure, its functioning. We also looked at the, the, the various issues coming around organizational change, the field of organization development. Then we moved on to the various descriptions of the group, group behavior. We also examined some of the key issues in relation to size, the role, the norms. Let us continue our discussion on the group and the group behavior and group dynamics. So, in this lecture, what we intend to convey and they understand is the following, particularly about the group and group conformity issue. We will also look at the compliance and what the dim different dimensions of this compliance. We will also see the identification and also we will examine the group uh, composition and issues related to that. We will also see effects of groups on individual behavior. We will also see social facilitation and the dimension of uh, de-individuation and how de-individuation results in some of the complex behaviors what we see in the organization. The issues what we need to really see is how can we understand some of these dimensions and then correct individual behavior in relation to the group so that we can build effective teams in the organization and effective teams are necessary for performance for the overall organizational effectiveness as well as the individual satisfaction. So, let us look at these issues in detail. When we use the word conformity, people usually desire acceptance by the group to which they belong. Everyone like it or not here would not like to be a kind of a deviant in any particular group. So, they look for belongingness, they look for approvals by the others and they also feel a psychological satisfaction when others respect, others accept and others also support. So, this respect, acceptance and support helps people to feel good about themselves. Therefore, the when you are seeing is that there are always individuals are susceptible to conformity pressures. Depending upon the nature of the group, depending upon the way they have interacted over a period of time demands that kind of a conformity. When we use this word conformity, the, the norms do play a significant role. So, norms do not exist without conformity. So, norms and conformity they support each other and conformity refers to that yielding to group influence. Yielding to group influence by doing or saving something you might otherwise choose not to do. So, in other words, individual subordinates, individual gives up, individual accepts, accepts the group and so that group will support or group can support and get that kind of a confidence in the members of the group and conformity is essentially ex establishes that kind of a relationship, a psychological understanding of the individual to the group and group requirements. So, when you see this, what are the pressures to conform? So, there is always an element of dependence. So, that means a group has the capacity to influence its members because it has the capacity to you know, create rewarding or punishing effects of their actions. So, that means for their actions, if it is not acceptable, other members may deny certain, uh, certain things. So, there is individual always depends upon on the group and the group members. So, when such dependents are there, some situations it becomes very vulnerable. There are points when somebody is looking for some career opportunities. So, he wants that kind of a group support. Sometimes he is being exploited or harassed by the boss 
again that individual depends upon the group. So, when we see uh, the organization when they fail to handle grievances properly, then the individual goes along with the group because he or she knows at the time of crisis it is the group and group support what would save the person. So, it is in that sense what happens is that people try to work with others and they also become vulnerable if they are also facing some crisis situations of the career, promotion, transfer, placements, alignments. So, whenever such things uh, come in the organization, then they, they become much more vulnerable compared to the other situations. So, the dependence is a kind of a, a real as well as psychological, but it builds that kind of a pressure to conform and that the individual believes conforming to the group and group expectations will be, you know, will create that required support at the time of crisis or at the time of any need. I think the groups have the power to reward and punish the group members. The effects are the outcome of the individual behavior could be maybe negative or positive. So, at times, you know, people do rebel about the to be about the why we should conform. So, they also try to rebel against the accepted uh, leadership. So, the question is how this the rewards and punishment is seen as and then how how the individual would, would like to react to these uh, outcomes. So, sometimes when the outcome is so negative, then the individual may reject the group, the individual may also what people call the visual blowing. So, people go out and then talk negative about the group or they take some examples and then show it to the others as that which is going against the organizational values or organizational goals. So, the groups do put pressure on the individual and that pressure depending upon the kind of a degree of punishment and the degree of rewards, it can have both positive as well as uh, negative consequences. But the pressure to perform, pressure to conform is always there and the group exerts such kind of a pressure on the individual. But two major social influence processes are used by the groups to obtain the conformity. One is the effect of dependence and also the people call it as the information dependence. So, the effect dependence if you see is the capacity to reward or punish group members and the it is highly reward dependence driven, but many a times it is also punishment. So, that means individual is able to see the consequences of the action and the other is the the social influence. So, that means it is the information dependence where the individual may be kept dark about the group and group activity, not involved at all or those of them who conform are also given some of the key, key roles to be performed. So, these, these are the kinds of things which will make the individual to react in a positive or otherwise. So, when you see this information dependence, individuals conforms to group pressures because they depend on others for information. So, when people do not give or when they do not talk, it becomes a kind of a pressure point. So, the, so the question is the information about the appropriateness, appropriateness of their thoughts, appropriateness of feelings, appropriateness of their behavior and then the interaction value results in this kind of an information dependence. So, information dependence also see that people conform to social pressure at different levels of uh, conformity. So, the at sometimes the they are getting into the compliance, sometimes it is the identification and the next level could be the internalization. So, conforming to group norms occur for three significantly different motives. And people have explored this in 
social psychology and social psychological studies have, uh, have covered this issues to understand how group exerts such pressures on the individual and how does the individuals go along with the group. And at the lowest level of conformity, you see the individuals comply with social pressures either to obtain a reward or to avoid a punishment. So there is uh, the principle where it is a very either could be a tangible or the intangible. But all the time the individuals are seeking that approval, seeking that kind of a reward and also the avoiding uh, the disapproval or moving away from the group for any of the reasons. So then usually the individuals go along with the expectations of the group leader and the group members. From compliance, if you see, however, this is a very temporary kind of a feeling and it is limited to the specific situation and then one can calculate the consequences of the action in terms of the reward or the punishment. But from compliance stage, if you see, the next level becomes the identification. The second level of uh, conformity is called the identification because the motive is to be accepted by others. Motive is to be accepted by the others as an important person. So perceived as important and that uh, the acceptance which is resulting in the respect for the individual helps people to be a part of that group. So always they talk about their membership. It is always they talk about their that is their reference group and this is a time where most of their individual identity is lost but then they talk about in reference to the kind of group to which they belong. Sometimes the, the organizational identification also is seen in the same fashion but it is more to do with the group where they strongly get attached to the, to the group, the particularly the work group builds that, builds this through employee engagement processes. So in that process where the individual feels strongly that he is doing something very important to the organization and strongly accepted and supported by the, by the other members and then an entry or exit of that member is seen as very critical to the group success. So that means they are always welcome on board and whenever they want to leave that group, it is disliked and people sad about it. So and then also people respect the individual to be a part of that kind of a group and group processes. So the identification refers to the process of behaving like significant others and then you know the and adopting their characteristics and personal attributes. So that means the group members create a kind of an acceptable or accepted kind of a behavior and the individual also imitates and internalizes and also talks about those things and then it and then see those things as very, very, very relevant and then the individual also shares with the others. So these are all can be seen some people are becoming part of the voluntary groups and whatever they do, the services and other things become much more important to them in their uh, lifestyle than the kind of a careers. For some, the careers are important within that career. Some, some of the things they do for the organization, that takes a value because they think that is what is like, that is what is approved, that is what is seen as the most relevant to the organization. So this identification moves into the next level of this compliance called the internalization. So internalization people are talking about it is the highest level of uh, conformity. In the highest level of con conformity, the standards of behaviors are internalized, means it is the, the individual accepts that the things are legitimate and people also talk about it is based on the ideology based on the larger purpose, the group, the strives to move. So the purpose and the, 
the, the activities provides the meaning to the individual. So, they become part of the, the person's basic character. So, that means the individual wants, <coughs> individual needs and then you also see the way group works for the group purposes and the vision, they are so close. So, the internalization stage, the individual significantly participates as though it is his personal pride and personal things and the group requirements and the individual needs are very closely linked. So, at this level of conformity, norms are followed because the person accepts the beliefs, attitudes and values as the supporting the norms. So, the, he strongly believes, people also talk about it is a kind of an ideology base. And then the norms are seen as, as supporting every, every of the perceptions of the individual about his own vision, his own attitude as well as the group demands. So, there is not much of a difference and the internalization supports that everything is right, everything is correct. So, when you see this, uh, what are the factors influencing conformity? We have talked about few of the things earlier, but certainly the group size. So, the group size, larger the size and many people are following the norms of the group or the expectations of the group, then it increases that conformity. Also similarly, the group composition, the people with high significance the, of the, what the individual perceives as, if they are following set of things and the role models where the individual values and they also do such things, then it also in, increases that kind of a conformity. So, the reference points and the kind of role models do influence if they have, if they are there in the group, they influence significantly this behavior of conformity. And also the, the unanimity of uh, group consensus. If the whole group is thinking very seriously and if they all believe and if they all believe in pursuing those set activities, set decisions, set goals and again then you see it has a significant impact on the conformity. And people also see this ambiguity. Ambiguity what we talked about the role ambiguities, ambiguous information also affects the conformity in a negative way because then people are not too sure what is to be done and why should it be done. So, clarity always helps conformity, ambiguity creates confusion and confusion results in no action or at times action without any understanding or application. Goal achievement is another important dimension. So, the conformity when people see that the success is there and they also see the sharing of the success, again that one would see that there is increase of conformity and also the self-confidence. When people are insecure, then it is not too clear whether they would like to follow the, the group, but the self-confidence where the group supports that individuality, people are supported means there is trust and respect. Again, this increases the conformity. But let us run through this, these variables again. The group pressure tends to increase as the size of the majority uh, right against increases. So, that means the more number of people are talking about the similar things. And the number of people needed to get maximum conformity depends on the nature of the influence attempt also depends upon the kind of issues and the, the group composition also to be seen. So, group members who are perceived as experts or as I said the role models or as highly qualified or experienced individuals and they exert great pressure to conform. So, when seniors speak, when people with understanding when they speak, or when they put in large number of uh, years of experience in the same job if they speak and that is the time where again the, the individual 
identifies with the group and sometimes they also internalize because the other seniors are doing this. So the group composition matters again significantly. And the minority group members tend to be highly influenced by the group pressure because they also become vulnerable. And the, and the vulnerable group always looks for support and then they try and follow whatever is being talked about and by the majority. And the unanimity of group consensus talked about the united group exerts much greater pressure to conform than a group divided by dissension. So if a large number of people, but if they are divided and they do have different opinions, that can only result in uh, ambiguity and confusion. And such confusions do influence the compliance and the compliance conditions as well as the, the behaviors. So group, when the large number of people talk about and the, the group also comes to that conclusion in a unanimous way and it is so the others have, will have no choice but to accept and proceed further. <laughs> Interestingly, there are many people use these technologies, the techniques and understanding to create and build a consensus as well. So as a good leader, they understand this situation. So what they do is, they create opinion leaders in the group and when they propose and some of these opinion leaders speak first and when three, four, five people speak very positively about the issue, then it is not easy for, a, for anyone else to take a very deviant view. So they also fall into the line. But if several people open up the issue and talk different things, normally the decision making is not going to be comfortable and you don't see the behaviors which are good for the team and so that there is not much of a compliance but more of dissension and more of non-obedience. So many have studied this as discovered that amount of conformity drops the perceptually, perceptuously when the group contained just one dissenter who might be perceived as a partner for the subject. So the, what happens is this dissents and the agreements need to be understood and that need to be managed. So one can conclude the, you know, the ASHA study that there are group norms that press us towards conformity and then also we desire to be one of the group and avoid being visibly different. So the group tends to go with other members and you know, the particularly the individual he finds it difficult to disagree with others. In fact, there are lab level studies, there are several simulations when, when the three thing, three lines are drawn and the first two agree with a few things and the third one has to use that information and then normally one cannot take that kind of very objective view, he would rather go with the group even though the facts may be saying something else. So one can generalize further to say that when an individual's opinion of objective data differs significantly from that of the other in the group, now he or she feels extensive pressure to align, pressure to align his or her opinion to conform with those of the others. So in that when the studies have shown that uh, what the first person would say, what the second person would say, and now the third person gets into the doubt, even though facts may be talking or saying something else. So then he would moderate his view, probably I am seeing this, I may be wrong, and then maybe I don't know how the others to have perceived, but somebody will become very defensive at that point of time. I think these are the experiences where the, how the group builds pressure on the individual. We have also seen this ambiguity. So the influence of the group from both information dependence and effect dependence becomes increasingly the powerful as the situation becomes more and more ambiguous. So the ambiguous situation increases the dependence and then the individual looks for more support and more more uh, reasons 
to talk to the other and that is the time where the individual's vulnerability comes into the fore. So, the ambiguity again builds that kind of a group uh, dependence and group dependence leads to that kind of a required behavior which is favorable to the conformity. And uh, group members can create ambiguity as an intentional strategy for inducing conformity. So, they may not share all of it what they know or sometimes they may send mixed signals so that individual is told unless you align properly, unless you work properly, unless you become a active group member, you may not get that all the required support and the details. So, the ambiguity to when we see the goal achievement, as groups get closer and uh, closer to achieving its goal, the anticipation of success increases the pressure to conform and makes non-conformity less acceptable because the achievement of the goal is much more serious and that depends upon the strong interpersonal relationship. It demands that uh, people have to work on a real-time basis in a very close fashion and exchange of information, uh, understanding of the challenges becomes very relevant and then if that is the time where really people have to people have to work together. So, it builds that kind of a pressure to conform and if somebody is, is non-conforming or violating the group expectations, I think such members become less acceptable because the group perceives the challenge. The group perceives that the requirement to requirement to deliver and, and perform. So, the the other important variable we saw is the self-confidence. The individuals who are highly confident of their skills and ability are less susceptible to the influence of group members because they think they are good and uh, they think they have plenty of opportunities. So, they see that, the, that they are above the group. So, the individuals who are high in uh, self-confidence, however, generally resist blaming themselves and instead prefer to blame the group for the discrepant judgments. So, they do not take that complete responsibility, but they also blame the groups and so they become vulnerable. The status, again another important aspect that I mentioned behavior within a group is influenced by the status of the individuals. People do use the status and status symbols and they want to bring that kind of an influencing behavior on the other. But the point is in any group where people pursue status and status symbols, that means they affect the cohesion of the group. And the, the status symbols could be very the tangible as well as intangible. Tangible in the sense they love the kind of office space they have, the kind of furniture they are using. These are some of the things could be the status symbol which is verifiable and people pursue such things to prove that they are better and they are good or they are experts or they are the, they are there in the managerial hierarchy. So, many of these things are associated with these uh, status symbols and organizations when they support such status symbol, usually it affects the, the group and group behavior because it creates more division amongst the group members. So, high status members enjoy a higher level of rank or social position and then because of either the formal or the informal status system. So, some because of their education, some because of the relationship what they have with the senior people or the, the bosses or if it is a family organization to the family members. So, such things do create that kind of a both formal and informal status systems. So, if when people pursue those status systems, it can affect the relationships, it can also create a kind of a hierarchy which also builds communication blocks within the, within the group and such divisions do affect the performance. 
formal status is acquired through the titles that is the kind of designations but then there are some titles which are very close could be the senior vice president and the vice president. So that's the time where but if people are working very hard on their titles and the that's the time where they don't want to communicate or they want to create a protocols of how one should talk to each other and things like that. And similarly the working relationship that who has the information, who has the authority, who has the approval powers, who can do few things. And also definitely the pay and the fringe benefits, people who are drawing higher salary, people who are getting more benefits are seen more important and more relevant compared to the others. And also the work schedules, so the status uh, indicate that those of them who work continuously are at a little lower level than those of them who have much more flexi time, much more uh, opportunity to come and go at their convenience and things like that as well as the location. So within the building and within the area of work, so where they are located and what kind of physical details they have. When you are talking about the informal status, it is acquired through the individual personal communications and association as well as the development of the group norms. So some people become very important and very relevant because they are giving solutions to the others. They are capable of understanding the problems, analyzing the problem and come with some innovative, innovative solution. Or some people are able to do their work they are able to do some work for the other and by doing such things they build that kind of a required relationship. Today we are also using the word social capital. The kind of network the individual is able to have in the organization and pursue that network to meet their own personal and group uh, success. So the status is also referred uh, as uh, attributed to as this kind of a referral power which they are able to get from the others. So when you see these issues, then we really have to move and talk about the effect of the group on this individual behavior. Two contrasting processes have been identified to explain the way the group affects the individual performs. One argument is the social facilitation view that the group and the individual behavior when you see how group influences the individual behavior in a positive way and there is also a negative thing called the social loafing as I mentioned in the past where the individual gives up his roles and responsibility to the others because he thinks he can do such things because there are so many people who are doing the similar things in the organization and the self the individual thinks he need not do and can relax in the presence of others. So when you see the effect of the group on individual behavior, another concept called is the de-individuation. De-individuation has also been proposed to explain the effects of the group on uh, individual behavior. So de-individuation as well as the social facilitation if you see, the presence of other group members tends to influence on the individual's performance. So the who is the significant other and in what context he is being present and the presence of others, what would happen to the individual performance has been a kind of a great interest to the social psychologist. That is where they are talking about the individual and the group and particularly the group influences on the, on the individual. The social facilitation if you see when, a, when well learned, that is when somebody knows the task well and the presence of others tends to increase the motivation because the individual is extremely good at. So for example the musician when other people, significant people sit and then and uh, proof that increases the motivation. So and also thereby improving the performance. So this is called the social 
facilitation effect. So, the way the individual knows and the individual can do, so that is the time where it, it enables further to do things better. But when a new task or when the response has not been well, uh, you know, well learned, that is the presence of others tends to inhibit performance because when you do not know really and the how to perform and then you are attempting to perform, you are not too sure how the group members and the others are going to judge. So, when you are in doubt of the reactions of the other, then it inhibits the performance. So, the individual would be thinking second time and the third time and so this is called the social inhibition effect because it is purely depends upon the other and the uncertainty in the other and then why they are present here and that too in a particularly where, I, where it is linked to the one's promotion, one's career or uh, interviews builds that kind of a tension in the individual. So, that is where when somebody is writing the examination, when somebody, some very senior person is the present in the hall, it energizes that those people who are writing the exam. But if you also see one of the senior persons comes and he stands next to you while you are writing the exam, that builds additional pressure. So, these additional pressure in a way it could be positive because it builds that kind of an energy to do this better. But sometimes it can also create that energy where it creates tension in the individual and slows down the performance. So, that means it also has a kind of a distraction value. Distraction value in the sense you are not too sure now you should focus on writing, writing your uh, exam or you should give importance to the person who is sitting or standing next to you. So, there is a value of this distraction, value of that increasing energy, but both of these things could be sometimes functional, it could also be dysfunctional, dysfunctional in the sense it affects the performance. So, in the, in the sense the social facilitation theory have worked on to understand what happens to the individual performance when the other persons are present or particularly when significant others are present. Social loafing is another dimension. We have seen when individuals work as a part of the group and their individual contribution cannot be identified or they tend to exert that kind of a less effort. So, we have seen this uh, the kind of a social loafing when the individual thinks that I need not do, nobody is noticing me. So, a tendency to become comfortable in the presence of others. It happens in the classroom when large number of people are uh, present that some individuals may think, okay, let me doze off, let me sleep, who will notice? So, it is that kind of a perception. So, people relax, people do not listen, people do not make notes and things like that. Similarly, in the organization, when large number of people are doing, some of the people they think, okay, they can go a little slow. The best thing about social loafing is when people are pulling a chariot called the Rathayatra. So, there are people you will see that they are holding the rope. There are some people who are pulling the rope. There are some people who just touch those people are holding the rope. So, we see many of these behaviors coming and some people may be walking just along with the rope. So, no doubt that these behaviors are there, but in social loafing what happens is the individual thinks I need not hold the rope and pull it because the anyway the others are doing such things. And if others fail, I will go and I will be able to pull which never happens as only an individual action. So, the social loafing is a kind of a psychological predisposition and which comes because of the others. How others are performing, how others are doing significantly influences. So, the social loafing is to be corrected by the managers and most of the time social loafing can be corrected through establishing the eye contact, through noticing, through conveying a message that 
you are observing. So, when you when you convey that that individual is being observed, individual is being noticed, most of the social loafing gets correct. Individuals then become more active and uh, they also take that kind of a required role to perform the group related task. The social loafing, the the part of it is, it is not attributed to a decline in ability, but a decline in motivation. So, it is not that individual feel that they cannot do, but they think they need not do. So, that is where the amount of effort extended comes down drastically and people think, okay, I will do it later and all kinds of things. So, the social loafing has to be understood and has to be corrected and it can best corrected by establishing eye contact, by establishing that the fact that every work, every activity, everything is being seen, being recorded, being observed and it has some consequence of reward and punishment. I think it is the last part of that of our discussion, we will move on to this de-individuation. Very interestingly, the de-individuation means that as in we see the increase in the size of the group, the individual start feeling that, that there is a loss of individuality, loss of individuality or the kind of a personal responsibility. So, they, they think that they are part of a crowd. So, that means the group moves into a kind of a crowd behavior and the larger the size, that is where the perception of this de-individuation as well. So, as the de-individuation sets in, there are you will see that individuals start shirking the responsibility and not only shirking the responsibility, it also leads to what people can think that I can do anything and I can get away with it. So, most of the socially deviant behaviors and the group deviant behaviors are seen as a part of this de-individuation. That means, the group provides that kind of a comfort to the individual and the larger the group size makes that individual to think that group as a whole is more responsible and then I can do what I want. And that is how you see the crowd behaviors. The individuals take a stone and then throw it or burn some cars or burn some vehicles and many of these things deviant behaviors we see. But if you talk to them as an individual, they will not do it. But when the, when the group psychology takes over or that crowd mentality comes in, then they think that they can do anything and the nobody is noticing or nobody can do anything. So, such behaviors do come. So, the de-individuation leads to that a disrespect for the norms of the group disrespect for the norms of the society and most of the time individual takes the law into to the you know, to their own hands and then to start thinking and start behaving accordingly. And the what is important is to correct this de-individuation by reducing the group size. So, the that is where when we talk about the group size, it is best kept around around 9 best kept around 11, but certainly not more than, not more than 11, because then, you know, the each member adding to that would be contribute to some bit of this social loafing and further to this de-individuation process. So, the de-individuation process, the, the best corrected by the leaders through establishing the individual relationship through individual contracts, recognizing their names, recognizing the faces becomes very important aspect of the de-individuation. If the top leaders keep themselves much away from the group and then if they do not know the, the background, their names, the indiv individual attributes and then that is the time where the, where the groups at the lower level or the group members feel that they are nobody in the organization. This feeling of nobody, the feeling of that 
that they are not cared for or they are not bothered and things like that results in this process of deindividuation. So then you will see that they will be carried away in that kind of a behavior. So then the such feelings when it is continued then it is either that may create either very desirable or undesirable behaviors. Most of the time unreasonable behaviors, undesirable behaviors depending upon the others and depending upon the crowd what they are part of. So what we have seen so far in this lecture is this. The, we have to see and understand how do we bring that kind of a required conformity in the group where people have the group uses that kind of a reward and punishment conditions. The group creates that kind of an opportunity to the individuals. Group provides that kind of a relationship of dependence and helps to help the, helps them to cover that kind of a vulnerability. The group also creates dependency through that the, the nature of information sharing. And once the individual starts conforming, and once they start complying and once they build that kind of a required identification, the group also starts responding to the individual and the by indivi the individual behavior, when the individual identifies with the group, then the, the group and the individual together contribute to the overall success of the organization but it depends upon the group composition, the size of the group and various factors what we have discussed do influence this conformity, compliance and the identification. But the internalized kind of a thing, when the, when the person understands all this, so then we will see the, the group builds that individual confidence, also accepts the, some of the deviant behaviors and the group maturity becomes much more relevant at this stage. And also the leadership is an important uh, variable and that is where you see the presence of the leader builds that kind of a social facilitation and the individual performance is not driven through the distraction but it is through providing that kind of a support for good contribution. At times we will also see this de-individuation and social loafing coming because of the group size. And that is where extremely important for the group leader to divide the task, to divide the, the specializations into a manageable or a meaningful whole so that there is control is possible and the relationships are possible and the individual gets that kind of a respect individual gets that kind of an identity. Otherwise, it may contribute to that kind of a deviant behavior where the individual may shirk the responsibility in the presence of others. And such rejection of the group itself or shirking of the responsibility would result in the kind of behaviors which people have seen it as a kind of a crowd behavior. In a crowd behavior, the individual thinks that I can do anything and can get away with it. And that is where understanding of the group and group processes would help managers to build good team functioning and correcting these dysfunctional behaviors and build positive behaviors in the workplace. And in this context, it is much more important to understand the nature of conflict and how conflicts come about in the work groups and what are the views about the conflict and different conflict management techniques. I think some of these things we need to explore. I think we will do this in our next lecture.